Picking up in verse 12, which is where we left off on Christmas Eve. So please bow your heads with me one last time. We're going to pray as we open God's word. Heavenly Father, we come to your word. Lord, we come with a sense of expectation, knowing that as we open your word, you're going to speak to us. You've got things to teach us and ways to transform us. And so, Lord, we ask that you would minister to us through your word. Uh, Change our hearts, minds, and lives by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you a question. If you could be anything, right, any kind of person, what kind of person would you choose to become? Like if you could make that choice, would you, maybe some of you would say, I wish that I had unlimited funds, right? Unlimited amount of money. I wish I was a billionaire with as much money as I could have to spend and do anything that I want to do and buy. Others of you would say, no, no, I want to be just a, a a great artist or a famous author or maybe a professional athlete, just someone of, of incredible skill, you know, who's able to use those skills for great things. Maybe others of you say, no, no, I wish that I was a powerful person, maybe the, the president of the United States or ruler of a country. Or maybe you'd say, you know what, I just keep it simple. I just want to be someone who has a happy family and a peaceful life. Well, in our study today, we're going to see something truly incredible about Jesus. And you know what that is? You see, here in the opening chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, one of the things that Matthew has been telling us, which is really at the heart of what we celebrate at Christmas time, is that Jesus, he wasn't just a smart person or a good teacher or a wise man. Jesus was actually God come to us in human flesh. Jesus was, as Matthew told us in Matthew chapter 1, he was Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so in the person of Jesus, what this means, what we celebrate at Christmas, is that God came to us in order to reveal his heart to us and to save us. But here's why I want you to think about that. Because if Jesus was God then you know what that means? That means that he was actually the only person in all of history who did get to choose what kind of person he would become. He got to choose the time and the place where he would be born. He got to choose where he would grow up and the kinds of things that would happen to him during his lifetime. And that's where it gets really interesting when you realize that Jesus made those kinds of choices because What kind of person did Jesus choose to become? When God came to this world, where did he choose to live? What kinds of people did he associate with? What kind of people did he identify with? Well, in our study today, what we're going to see, we're going to see how Jesus, even though he was born in Bethlehem, he came to be known as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, we're going to talk about why that happened, the journey that took place, but also the choice that was involved in that. And as we do, I want you to be asking this question. What does that tell us about Jesus? And what does that mean for us who want to be followers of Jesus? So the titles of today's message is Becoming a Nazarene. Becoming a Nazarene. And what we're going to see here in Matthew chapter 2, verses 12 through 23, we're going to see this, that despite his majesty... Jesus brought himself low in order to lift up those who humble themselves before him. Let me give you that sentence one more time. I'd love it if you'd write that down. I see some of you take a photo of it so you can remember that. I love that. Take this thought with you as you go into your coming week. And here's what it will be. This will be our outline also for studying through these verses. Despite his majesty, Jesus brought himself low in order to lift up those who humble themselves before him. Let's look at the first part of that. Despite his majesty. Now, so far in the Gospel of Matthew, we've seen Jesus' majesty on display. We've seen that he's the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the, the one whom God promised to one day send to save the world from the curse of sin and death. We've seen that he's the long-awaited son of David, the king from David's royal line who will establish an everlasting kingdom. He's Emmanuel, God with us, come to save us. He is the hope of the world. And yet, despite Jesus' majesty, in this section we're going to read about something that happened which absolutely changed the course of his life and which defined the rest of his life. In the first 11 verses of Matthew chapter 2, which we looked at in our previous study, we saw how... After Jesus was born, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem to pay homage to Jesus and to worship him. But when King Herod, who was the Roman appointed ruler of Israel, when he heard about this, he became scared and he became worried 
that this newborn king, Jesus, might represent a threat or a challenge to his authority. And so after Herod had heard from the wise men that they had come to worship the newborn king, Herod told them, he said, okay, you guys go to Bethlehem, where it was prophesied that the Messiah would be born. He said, you go to Bethlehem, find that Messiah, and once you find him, come and tell me where he is so I can go and worship him too. But the thing was that when Herod said he wanted to worship Jesus, what he actually meant was he wanted to murder Jesus. You know, sometimes you get those words mixed up, I guess, right? And so as the wise men found Jesus and gave their gifts to him and worshiped him, it says now where we pick up in chapter 2, verse 12, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now that brings us to the next part of our sentence, right? So despite his majesty... Jesus brought himself low. It says in verse 13, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. Now, Egypt was outside of Herod's jurisdiction, and it says then in verse 15 that they remained there until the death of Herod, and this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Now, here in this section, in verses 13 through 23, there's an interesting structure to this this section. Three times, Matthew is going to tell us something that happened to Jesus, And then he's going to say, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. So every time he ties in an event from Jesus' life to a prophecy from the Old Testament. Now, this is actually one of the most important features of Matthew's gospel. Matthew wants to show us over and over, over 50 times. Some would even say as many as 70 times in his gospel. Matthew's going to do this, where he's going to say, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. He wants to... He wants us to see that many of the events in Jesus' life were the fulfillment of promises and prophecies from the Old Testament. So Matthew's gospel is very important because what it gives us is like a bridge connecting the Old Testament to the New Testament. It helps us see the continuity of what God has been doing and is still doing throughout history and how it is fulfilled in Jesus. And so Jesus and Mary and Joseph, they go into exile They become refugees in the land of Egypt until the death of Herod. And we don't know how long that was. It it could have been a couple of years is what is assumed. Now, when I I lived in Hungary, um, before I moved here to Colorado, one of the things my wife and I were involved in was ministry to refugees. And we lived in this city, pretty large city. And at the end of town, there was an abandoned military base. And they had converted that, but not really. They had just basically put people in it, in in these rooms that were, it was basically still abandoned, but they were housing about 2,000 refugees at any given time in this refugee camp, in this abandoned military base at the end of our city. There were about 2,000 people, generally, who were housed there, and mostly from Asia and Africa. And Rosemary and I would go there, we would spend time with these people, we would provide humanitarian aid to meet their physical needs, and we would talk with them about Jesus. We'd give them Bibles in their own languages to read. And one of the things that we noticed spending time with these refugees, especially when we left the camp and came into town with them, was the way that people treated them. I mean, most people in the city did not want them there. They were unwanted in the city. And you can kind of understand why they would not want them there because these refugees, they didn't contribute anything to society. They didn't have any money and they weren't allowed to work because of their legal status. And so they didn't have any money. They couldn't contribute. They couldn't speak the language. And really there was nothing to be gained socially by spending time with these people. Now, there was a pastor from Oregon at that time named Larry, and Larry took interest in the work that we were doing with refugees there in Debritz and Hungary. And and one time, Larry, he called us up and he said, hey, I have an idea. I want to come over. I want to bring a group from our church, and I want to put on a retreat 
for the refugees. And, and his idea was this. He said, okay, I want you to like rent out rooms in a nice place in a nice part of Hungary. And then we're just going to have an all inclusive, right? Like everything paid retreat for three days for these refugees. And so we did that. We found this place and we got them nice rooms and their meals were paid for. They're good meals. And we would meet up during this time for times of Bible study and prayer and worship. And Larry said, you know, here's his goal. He said, I want to treat these people like royalty. And so we went to this retreat. We brought all these refugees with us to this retreat center. And I realized as we were doing this that for the first time, maybe in many years, maybe for some of them in their life, this was the first time that they'd been treated nicely, right? That they'd, been, they'd, they'd experienced hospitality and been welcomed in and treated as equals. Because for so many years, I mean, these were unwanted people. And the first night of the retreat, Larry, he began our time of Bible study and, and prayer. He, he began it by addressing those who were gathering. He said, you know, friends, he said, I want you to know that God loves you and that Jesus cares about you. And then he said something that kind of surprised me. He said, because did you know that Jesus himself was a refugee at one point in his life too? And when he said that, I was kind of like, what is he talking about? Like, what, what is that? And what's he referring to? And then Larry went on to read this exact passage that we're studying right here about how Jesus and his family fled their country when Jesus was young because of a tyrannical ruler who was trying to kill him. And for the rest of the evening, Larry and his team listened to these people's stories and prayed for them. And for me, it was such a powerful moment that I've, I've never forgotten because it was so powerful to be there with these very poor and unwanted people and realizing that Jesus became like them. In a world where he could become anything, Jesus became like them, a foreigner, an exile. And Matthew tells us that this was done to fulfill a prophecy from the book of Hosea. This prophecy is found in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, where it says, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now, it's really interesting, by the way, that Matthew uses this prophecy and attaches it to Jesus and says that it's a prophecy about Jesus. Let me explain why. Because if you go and look at Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, you'll notice one thing right away, is that in its original context, when Hosea wrote this, he was writing this about the nation of Israel. In other words, in that passage, God is saying, out of Egypt I called my son. The son he's referring to is the nation of Israel. And he's speaking about the Exodus, which was that event in Israel's history when they had been in slavery in Egypt and God brought them out through the plagues and through the Passover and the parting of the Red Sea. And God brought them out of slavery in Egypt. And essentially, Hosea is just making a historical comment. Historically, God brought his people, called his son Israel out of Egypt. So that's where it gets interesting, right? Because if this passage in Hosea is talking about how God brought Israel out of Egypt, then why does Matthew say that this is a prophecy about Jesus that's fulfilled by Jesus? Well, well, first of all, one of the things it shows us is that as the Holy Spirit was inspiring the prophets and giving them the words to write and to speak, Sometimes there was a depth of meaning to their words, which even they themselves were not aware of in the moment. You see, Hosea didn't realize that he was giving a prophecy about the Messiah. He thought he was making a historical statement about the nation of Israel. But those exact choice of words, using the word or the phrase, my son, you see, that was inspired by God to be a prophetic utterance, a prophetic utterance prophesying about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, that God would bring him out of Egypt where he would be in exile hiding from Herod. Now, in addition to that, though, and this is where I think it gets really interesting, in each of these three Old Testament quotations that are in these 10 verses here at the end of Matthew chapter 2, in each of these three quotations, Matthew is going to use a passage from the Old Testament, and what he's going to do is he's going to show us how Jesus is connected to the larger story of God's work through the nation of Israel. Think about it like this. Just as God brought Israel out of Egypt and saved them from murderous Pharaoh who was doing what? 
killing Jewish baby boys. Now God brings the Messiah out of Egypt, saving him from murderous King Herod, who is also killing Jewish baby boys. We'll get to more of that in just a moment. But in other words, there are connections between the life of Jesus and the history of Israel. Just as Israel passed through the waters of the Red Sea, the next thing we're going to see is that Jesus will enter the waters of baptism. Just as Israel wandered in the wilderness, we're going to see after that that Jesus then has a season of temptation in the wilderness. Just as Israel had 12 tribes, Jesus will have 12 disciples. And the parallels continue. And the reason for these parallels is because Jesus, the Messiah, he is taking up the mantle of the nation of Israel. The calling and the identity, he's taking it upon himself. And where Israel failed, Jesus, the Messiah, is going to succeed. You see, Israel, as we see in Hosea 11, was called to be God's son and called to be a light to the nations who would walk in God's ways and reveal God's heart and God's truth to the world. But in many ways and at various times, the nation of Israel failed to live up to and fulfill this calling. But now the Messiah has come, the true son of God, the light of the world. He will walk in God's ways flawlessly and he will reveal God's love and God's truth perfectly. See, even though Hosea didn't realize it when he wrote those words, they were inspired by God as a prophecy about Jesus. But it goes on in verse 16 to say this, then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Now, this event is known as the slaughter of the innocents. And honestly, it's a truly horrific part of the Christmas story. Based on the estimates of the population of Bethlehem at this time, historians, they believe that this probably amounted to between 30 and 50 children who were killed by Herod. And this event, right, it's a, it's a stark reminder of why Jesus came into the world. It's because of things like this that Jesus had to come into the world. It's because there is evil and injustice in our world, because there is sorrow and suffering and death. That is why Jesus came. He came because this world we live in is not so much a playground as it is a battlefield. And Matthew tells us that in verse 17, this fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Now this is a quotation from Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 15. And it's in its original context, it was a lament over the fact that a foreign king, originally in that case Babylon, had come in and invaded Israel and was taking their children away into exile. Rama, if you're wondering where that is, it's near Bethlehem, and it's the place where the Jews were gathered up in order to be shipped off to Babylon. And this prophecy, what it does, it portrays Rachel, who's one of the mothers or the matriarchs of the Jewish nation. It portrays Rachel weeping over her children, whose lives are being taken away by foreign oppressors. And now once again, Matthew is connecting the history of Israel to the events of Jesus' life. You know, in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, God gives us a vision. Specifically in chapter 12, it's as if he zooms out and gives us the big picture, not just of what's happening in Revelation especially, but actually what the story of the world is in Revelation chapter 12. He gives us a vision of the spiritual battle that is taking place here on earth and that has been taking place for generations and millennia. And in that vision, God says, here's, here's what the world is really like. He describes Satan as being a dragon and he describes Israel as being a woman who is pregnant with a child. The child that Israel will give birth to is the Messiah, Jesus. Jesus. 
And there in Revelation chapter 12, it describes how throughout history, the dragon, Satan, has been trying to kill the woman, Israel, in order to prevent the child, the Messiah, from being born. And this is the reason why Satan wants to destroy and thwart God's plan. He wants to do that. That's why he's trying to destroy Israel. It's why he's trying to destroy the Messiah, to thwart God's plan of salvation for humanity. See, Satan knows what his fate will be. He knows that he's doomed as it is. And so what do you do when you're doomed? When you get pushed into the pool, what do you do? You try and grab as many people and take them in down with you. That's what Satan's doing. He knows his fate. And in other words, if he's going down, his goal is to take as many people down with him as well. And so throughout history, Satan has been trying to thwart and ruin God's plan of salvation. First, by destroying Israel so that the Messiah won't be born. And then once the Messiah is born, trying to destroy him as well. That's what happened during the Babylonian captivity. That's what this prophecy is referring to. And that's what's happening now, again, as Herod tries to kill Jesus. Whether Herod realizes it or not, in his efforts to protect his own power, his actions are motivated by and inspired by Satan. This is part of that broader attempt to end and put a, a, a wrench in God's plan of salvation for humanity. And yet, as I hope you know, God's plans will not be thwarted. Just as God preserved a remnant through the Babylonian captivity, now God is also able to preserve the Messiah from being killed until the right time for his death has come. You see, friends, God is faithful to keep all of his promises, and God is powerful enough to bring all of his plans to fruition. The good work of salvation that God has begun he will also be faithful to bring that work to completion. And you know what? That's not just true for Israel. It's not just true in history. But it's true for your life as well. If you put your faith in Jesus, then here's what the Bible says. That the good work that God has begun in you, he will be faithful to see it through and bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ then you can be confident that he who is in you, Jesus, is greater than he who is in the world, Satan. Satan may be mighty, but God is infinitely mightier. You see, Satan may try to cause pain and destruction, and that pain and destruction is real. Look, at, it mentions this Rachel. She's weeping and refusing to be comforted. That pain and hurt is real, and yet God's plan will still prevail. The salvation that he gives far outshadows any momentary afflictions that Satan can inspire or inflict. The good news of the gospel, the Bible tells us, is that the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And because of what Jesus did, what he accomplished, all those who put their trust in him will be saved. And no matter how painful this life may be, we're given this promise in Romans chapter 8 that the sufferings of this present time are not even worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. It says in verse 19, When Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother. Go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, this passage is fascinating for several reasons. I want to show you why. Jesus and his family, they return from exile in Egypt. And like many refugees, even today, when it came time for them to go home, they had no home to return to. And we see here that initially, Joseph had intended to settle with his family in Judea, which is the southern part of Israel. That's where Jerusalem and Bethlehem are located. They're in Judea, that southern part of Israel. But what happened when King Herod died is that Herod, you know, he had ruled over Israel as kind of like a united entity. But then when he died, he divided up 
the rule of Israel between his four sons. So he divided Israel into four areas and put each of his four sons in charge of one of those areas. So Judea came under the jurisdiction of Herod's son Archelaus. He's the one mentioned here. That, that was the southern part of Israel. But the northern part of Israel, Galilee, came under the rule of another one of Herod's sons, who you also read about in the Bible. His name was Herod Agrippa. And so, or sorry, not Herod Agrippa, Herod Antipas, Herod Antipas. And so, whereas Joseph had initially planned to settle down in Judea when they returned to Israel, God warned him in this dream not to do that because Archelaus would have been just as inclined to find and kill Jesus as his father was. And so Joseph, having received this warning from God, he decides to settle with his family in Nazareth in the region of Galilee in the northern part of Israel. And Matthew says that this was done to fulfill what was spoken by the prophets, that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. Now that's where it gets really interesting. And here's why. If you look through the Old Testament and try and find a prophecy that says that the Messiah will be from Nazareth, you will find nothing. There is no prophecy in the Old Testament that says that the Messiah would come from Nazareth. And so what is this talking about? How can, how can Matthew say that this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet if there's no prophecy that says that the Messiah, even that the Messiah will be from Nazareth or a person from Nazareth? Now, and by the way, there's a good reason for that. It's because Nazareth did not exist during the time of the Old Testament. There's no Old Testament mention of Nazareth. You can look through the entire Old Testament. It's never mentioned. It didn't exist at that time. You see, from archaeology, we know that in the time when Jesus lived in Nazareth, it was a small and it was an unwalled town. That's what they tell us, an unwalled town. And it was right next door to a major Greco-Roman city called Sephoris. You can still visit Sephoris to this day if you go to that area. Now, the fact that Nazareth was an unwalled city, what that means is it was what we would call in our day underdeveloped. It was poor. It lacked basic infrastructure. It was a Jewish village located in a region which was predominantly pagan. And that's probably why Joseph originally wanted to settle down in Judea rather than Galilee. Because Judea is where Jerusalem is at. And if you're going to be raising the Messiah, well, it would make a lot of sense for him to be near Jerusalem, the seat of the royal throne, the place where the temple was located. You see, Judea was kind of like the Bible belt of Israel. But let's just say that Galilee was, was not the Bible belt of Israel, okay? Uh, whereas Judea was pure ethnically, if you will, right? It was a purely Jewish region. Galilee was a mixed region, both ethnically and religiously. There were Jews there, but there were also a lot of Gentiles. In fact, in the Old Testament, Galilee is often referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles. If there was anything that Nazareth was known for, it was known as a place that nobody wanted to go. In the Gospel of John, we read, we read in John chapter 1 about how when someone heard that Jesus was from Nazareth, his immediate response is, what? Like, can anything good come out of Nazareth, that dumpy place? In other words, Nazareth was kind of like a byword. It was the place where nobody wanted to go. You know, I grew up in Denver, and in Denver... For us, that was East Colfax, right? If you remember, like, it's almost like a meme, right? Like, we make fun of East Colfax. It's a place where nothing good ever happens. It's a bad place where bad things happen. You know, in every region, every city uh, where you go, there's always, like, one town, right? No matter every state, every region, there's always one town that people make fun of and, and make jokes about. You know, one time I, when I first came to Whitefields, I was, uh, you know, preaching and... Uh, and I, I was talking about Nazareth, and I said, you know, Nazareth was so bad. It was the, it was the Pueblo, Colorado of Israel. <laughs> and this guy came up to me afterwards, and he's like, you know, I will have you know, I am from Pueblo, Colorado. And I said, well, perfect. Then you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so here's the question. Why does Matthew say 
that this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. What prophecy is he talking about? Well, there are two possible answers to that. And I actually believe that both of them are true. Let me explain. You see, the word Nazareth comes from the word in Hebrew, netzer, which in Greek is nazar, which means shoot. And what, what I mean by shoot is like, think of like uh, when a plant starts to grow and it's just a little shoot, right? Like a baby branch. So Nazareth, if you will, means shoot town. And so when Matthew says Jesus settled in Nazareth, shoot town, because the prophet said that he would be a shoot, a Nazarene. And in the Old Testament, there are several prophecies which refer to the Messiah as a shoot or a branch. Let me read to you this one from Isaiah chapter 11. It says, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Jesse, by the way, is the name of David the king's father. A shoot will come from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Now this is talking about the Messiah, and it calls him a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And the picture there, think about that, a stump. What is a stump? A stump is like when you cut down a tree and it looks like it's dead. But sometimes it's not dead, right? And so the stump looks dead, but out of that seemingly dead stump, suddenly a shoot springs forth from it. New life, new growth, rising up out of death. Because remember, the royal line of King David had seemingly ended. We talked about that in chapter 1. But then Jesus, the Messiah, he is a new shoot out of the stump of Jesse. Now it's almost certain that Matthew had that prophecy in mind when he said that Jesus fulfilled what was spoken by the prophecies, that he would be a Nazarene. He would be a shoot from shoot town. But there's another sense in which the prophet said that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. You see, Nazareth, as we've been talking about, was a place that was despised and looked down upon. It had a bad reputation. If you called someone a Nazarene, that was not a compliment, right? That, that was an insult to refer to someone as a Nazarene. And one of the things the prophet said about the Messiah is that he would be despised and not highly esteemed. Here's what it says in Isaiah 53. It says, for he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. There's that idea again of a shoot. And then it says, he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. You can just imagine Joseph telling Mary that they were going to go back to Nazareth, the same town that they had come from when they went to Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth. Mary would have said, are you kidding me? Nazareth? You're taking me back to that dump? Not to mention how those people treated us. Don't you remember, Joseph, how those people treated us when I got pregnant? Don't you remember the way they talked about us, the rumors they spread about us? I certainly am not going back there. And it, and it didn't help, right, that when we got pregnant, then we left town and never came back. Surely that must make them even more suspicious. They must think that everything they suspected about us must actually be true. And now we're going to show up again, and they're just going to talk about us more, and it will be unbearable. Maybe it was the only place where Joseph knew someone where he could be sure to find work. And, and so Jesus, he goes to Nazareth, and he's despised by the people of Nazareth, but he's also despised by other people for being from Nazareth. And here's what I find really interesting. For the rest of his life, Jesus becomes known as Jesus of Nazareth. Even though he was actually born in Bethlehem, right? I mean, Bethlehem was a prestigious city. That was the city of the great king, David. It was a place also where the best lambs were raised for sacrifice in the temple. Wouldn't it have been even maybe better or make maybe make more sense for Jesus to be known or to identify as Jesus of Bethlehem. That was true. That was where he was born, where he spent the early years of his life. If he's the Messiah, and we know that the prophecies say the Messiah will be from Bethlehem, then wouldn't that actually even help people to recognize that he's the Messiah? If he's Jesus of Bethlehem, what, what a nice name. And it would be true. And yet, did you know it wasn't only other people 
who called Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. But Jesus himself identified himself as Jesus of Nazareth. It's as if Jesus was saying, you know that place that you make fun of and look down on? That's my kind of place. Those are my kind of people. It's kind of like calling himself Jesus of East Colfax. (laughs) And then here's what's incredible. In the Bible, when we read that the followers of Jesus, the early Christians were also called Nazarenes. They were called the sect of the Nazarenes. That was the name that the early Christians had. Before they were called Christians, they were called the sect of the Nazarenes. When people called Christians Nazarenes, that was not a compliment. When cynical unbelievers said that Jesus was a Nazarene or that his followers were Nazarenes, they were saying that with guile in their words, right? With poison on their tongue. They were saying it with disgust, as if they were heaping contempt upon him, those Nazarenes. And yet both Jesus and his followers, they took that title, Nazarene, and they wore it as a badge of honor. That is who we are. Why? Because this is the heart of the Christian message. This is the heart of the gospel. This is the heart of who Jesus is and why he came and what he came to do. God planted his son in the midst of Galilee of the Gentiles because he came not just to be the king of the Jews, but to be the savior of the world. And he associated with and he identified with the lowly. He didn't come to look down his nose at people, but he made himself low in order that he might lift up those who humble themselves before him. Friends, the message of the gospel is that despite his majesty, Jesus brought himself low in order to lift up those who humble themselves before him. The German writer Goethe, he says this. He says, you can easily judge the character of a man by how he treats those who can do nothing for him. As followers of Jesus... What does it mean for us that Jesus was called a Nazarene and that we who follow him are also called on to take the identity of a Nazarene? Well, First of all, it means radical humility. Rather than looking down on others as followers of Jesus, we identify with the lowly. We seek out ways to serve others and lift them up. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul the Apostle writing to fellow believers in Jesus, he says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And he says, have this same mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God something to be grasped, but instead he emptied himself. Other translations say he made himself of no reputation by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What we're reading here in Matthew chapter 2, this is how Jesus emptied himself and became of no reputation. He became a refugee. He became a Nazarene. But why? Here's why. He did it for you. Do you know that? Think about that phrase one more time. You can judge the character of a person by how they treat those who can do nothing for them. What does that tell us about Jesus? What we've seen here in the Gospel of Matthew is that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, come to save us. As God, do you realize there is nothing that we can do for him to add to who he is? There's nothing we can do to increase his majesty. There's nothing that we can add to him. There's nothing he needs from us that we can give him. And yet, how did Jesus treat us who could do nothing for him? He gave his life for us. He came and lived among us in order to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He traded his heavenly throne for a cross and his crown of glory for a crown of thorns in order to save you because he loves you. That is truly incredible. Just like a father or mother who stoops down to speak to their little child and lift them up, God has stooped down to us in the person of Jesus to communicate to us and to lift us up. It says in James chapter 4, verse 6, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. 
And if you will humble yourself before the Lord and admit your need for his grace, if you'll humble yourself before him and put your trust in him as your savior and give your life to him as your Lord, then he will lift you up and give you grace and forgiveness, strength for today and hope for eternal life. See, just like the term Nazarene, there was another term that Jesus' enemies also used against him that they considered to be an insult, but which Jesus embraced and said, yes, that's exactly who I am. Two times we read that people tried to insult Jesus by calling him the friend of sinners. But Jesus said, no, 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 that's right. You're absolutely right. That is exactly who I am. And if you will humble yourself before him today, then you can receive his grace in your life as well. I heard this greeting that a church in Philadelphia used to use every Sunday. And I want to share it with you as we close today. They would begin every service by saying this. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus, the friend of sinners. Because despite his majesty, Jesus brought himself low in order to lift up those who humble themselves before him. Would you please bow your heads with me and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you praise and glory this morning because of your majesty, because of who you are. But Lord, how much more majestic do we realize that you are now, that we see how you laid your glory aside, made yourself low for us to lift us up. What incredible love, what incredible grace. Lord, may, may this move us to be followers of you, Jesus the Nazarene, the friend of sinners. Lord, help us that we would be a friend to those around us who need to know your love and your truth. Help us, Lord, to humble ourselves before you and to serve others as you have served us. So now we take the elements for communion, the bread and the cup. And we remember how you served us, Jesus, not just in your life, but with your death. You held nothing back from us in order to lift us up. And so, Lord, we don't want to hold anything back of ourselves from you. We take this bread and we remember your body broken for us on the cross of Calvary. How our sins were laid upon you and you took the judgment for them in order that we might be saved, in order that we might be forgiven, that we might have new life, that we might be accepted and redeemed. And Lord, we believe that this is true, that you accomplished everything that you set out to do for our salvation and through your death on the cross. So we take this bread now and we say thank you. We confess our sins to you that we've fallen short in so many ways in word and deed, in action and in inaction. But we thank you, Lord, that you are greater than all of those things. And what you did is enough to forgive our sins and give us the hope of new life. So we take this bread now together in faith that what you did for us was truly enough. And we take it with thanksgiving and humility before you today in Jesus' name. And we take this cup, your blood shed for us, poured out for us to wash us clean and make us new, your life given for us so that we could have new life and everlasting life in you. And so as we take this cup, we take it thankful for what you've done for us in the past and knowing that it will be sufficient, Lord, for us to have eternal life with you forever. And we look forward to the day when we will be in your kingdom, eating and drinking at your table in that day that's just to come. So keep us in your grace until that time we pray in Jesus' name as we take this cup.